It was along this frozen, rutted road that the army arrived on December 19, 1777. There were Native Americans and patriots of African descent, boys who had signed on for adventure and men as old as 70. They were carpenters who had traded their mallets for muskets and bakers who had left the spicy warmth of ovens for the acrid smell of battle. They were farmers and physicians. Just three months ago, some of them had been there for the confusion and defeat at Brandywine. And more recently, in early October, these clerks and forge masters, gentlemen and laborers, had tasted near victory at Germantown. They were the world's most highly paid enlisted men when they got paid, yet they marched poorly, were of an independent nature, and didn't really understand rank and the military manner. They were linked, however, by the goal of liberty, and they were hopeful of the final outcome. They had grown increasingly aware that the commissary department was having problems getting them food, clothing, and supplies. 2,000 of them were without shoes. They were thinner, more haggard than they had been months before. The sick and wounded had been weeded from the ranks and sent to outlying hospitals. Those who had enlisted for money had begun to question each succeeding payless payday. Any who had joined for adventure had been forced to develop patience in the five inactive weeks the army had just spent at White Marsh. Those who simply sought to push the British from their homeland now looked ahead with frustration at the coming of winter and months of non-confrontation. The tracks in the muddy roads had frozen into razor-sharp ridges which cut at their feet. And as the first snows of winter fell, they came to this Pennsylvania farmland. They knew all too well that General Howe and his British troops had already made their way to Philadelphia and would occupy the Patriot capital for the winter. Today, we come from 50 states and from throughout the world to see this Valley Forge. We come in every season. The rolling hills of spring beckon, and nature treats us to her autumn palette. We come for different reasons, for the solitude or the beauty. We may pause near rows of cannon, no longer watchful, or linger in stately groves, quiet now where once an army labored. Mostly, we come to visit history. Some come upon the site of the original Iron Forge, built here along Valley Creek in 1742. People called it the Valley Forge, and so the area gained its name. But the forge was gone before General Washington arrived, burned by the British on their sweep into Philadelphia in September. Three months later, the Continental troops marched in. Trees were cut and stacked to become huts. And hills were transformed for defense. And Valley Forge became a home, a cold, hungry home for the winter. And it became famous for that winter. Now it has become a park, a national historic park. But more than merely vistas and panoramas, more than statues and signs, this is a place with a story to tell. And it is told here, and here, and here. It is a place to experience as much with our imagination as with our eyes, meaningful as much for what we know happened here as for what we find today. That's what this park is for. These monuments, these footprints of the past, offer us a memory to be shared, to be appreciated. Here, spreading out from the banks of the Schuylkill River, just 18 miles north of Philadelphia, we celebrate the transformation of the American soldier, a triumph of will over want, and with it, the forging of a spirit that was to assure independence for a nation determined to determine for itself. This is Valley Forge National Historical Park.
While the Continental Congress was pressuring General George Washington to continue waging a winter campaign, the American commander wisely chose Valley Forge as a site to camp his troops for the winter. This selection satisfied a number of special interests. For Congress, it meant that the war didn't stop dead in its tracks. For the Pennsylvania state government, it was a site close enough to disrupt British raiding and foraging activities. It meant the army could protect Pennsylvania's rich farming region. At the same time, it offered an 18-mile safety cushion against a surprise British attack. High ground made it naturally defensible. And it was a bit of a public relations move as well. It spared the local citizenry, already wary of the arrival of some 12,000 strangers, from having billeting imposed on them. At the same time, the chance to place such a significant patriot presence in a community which was known to be divided between patriots, loyalists, and pacifists had to be seen as a good idea by Washington. While most were spared the inconvenience of having troops posted to their homes, some local housing was rented as quarters for general officers. General James Varnum of Rhode Island made use of the upper floor of the Stevens family farmhouse, overlooking the Grand Parade, until a proper hut could be built to house him. A light snow covered the ground when the men arrived at Valley Forge that week before Christmas. There was much to do, and that was a welcome relief from the boredom of waiting at White Marsh. Brigade assignments were made. Here, the brigade of Peter Muhlenberg, the fighting parson, would man the outer defenses to the south. And here along the west were Maxwell's brigade. And Conway's, and Huntington's, and Macintosh's. A $12 prize was offered for the first well-constructed hut in each regiment. Although Washington himself issued orders which prescribed the construction design and dimensions, the log city that grew on these 2,000 acres was less than uniform. The troops were of a highly individualistic nature and were in a hurry to get under shelter. Supplies were scarce, with a shortage of tools, axes, and nails. Despite one man in four being unfit for duty for lack of shoes or clothing, at least one hut had been completed by December 21st. Most of the men were under roof within a month. As the dimensions varied, so too did the conditions in the huts, depending on the skill of the builders, the superiority of the building material, and the location. The Connecticut men on the east slope of Mount Joy, for example, generally fared much better than men from North Carolina and New Hampshire. But as Colonel Timothy Pickering later wrote to his wife, the huts are warm and comfortable. Fortifying the encampment was an important task and kept the men quite busy. Even before the main body of the army arrived, Washington had sent Chief Engineer Louis Duportail ahead to survey the lay of the land. The redoubts and entrenchments you see today are remnants of his defensive plan. With the Schuylkill River along its northern boundary, Valley Creek forming its western edge, and with the inner lines of defense on the high ground of Mount Joy, the encampment was very secure. The outer line defenses forming the southern side of the triangle added to what nature it already provided. Here, looking out from a high ridge, the Pennsylvania and Virginia troops formed an initial obstacle against possible British attack from the south. If such an attack were to overcome this first line of defense, the men could fall back to an inner defense line built along Mount Joy. Entrenchments lines of ditches three feet deep and six feet wide and backed by dirt walls were formed to deter an approaching force. Behind these entrenchments, as Duportail had suggested, the men built redoubts. These earthen forts, constructed by packing dirt into walls 10 feet high, could shelter as many as 50 or 60 troops 
It was common practice for armies to attempt to lob shells over the walls and into a redoubt. If the British were successful in doing that, this inner dividing wall could at least protect the men huddled in the compartment not directly hit. Redoubt number three along the inner defense line was built to guard the right flank. Redoubt number four did the same on the left. Abati, cut trees with sharpened branches, were placed in key positions along the inner line. With this imposing structure in place, and with artillery reinforcing the inner defense line, Duportail had created an almost impregnable defensive position. Here in Artillery Park, General Henry Knox trained his artillerymen. Few in number, each was trained not only for a specific duty, but was prepared to fill in for any jobs which the dictates of battle might require. Knox's artillery brigade was quite proud of its preparedness, flexibility, and its growing capabilities. Because there were so few cannon, and since many of the draft animals had died during the winter, the central location of the artillery was vital to assure that the cannon could be moved quickly and efficiently wherever they would be needed. Along the northern edge of the camp, near Varnum's quarters, a star-shaped redoubt was manned by Varnum's brigade. Its job was to protect Sullivan's Bridge, some 250 yards down this hill. At the time of the encampment, trees did not obstruct the sight lines, so the men in this redoubt had a clear and commanding view of the bridge which had been built to preserve communication with the north side of the camp and for use in case a retreat was called for. While some officers shared quarters with local families, just as Varnum did, General Washington needed to rent an entire building to house his large military family. The Potts House became the command center for the whole Continental Army during the months of the Valley Forge encampment. There were detachments at Wilmington and Trenton, and other units of the Army as far away as New England or Georgia. Messengers were constantly coming and going back and forth to these distant units. There was also the need to deal continually with a less than cooperative Congress, now sitting in exile in York, Pennsylvania. Additionally, the individual state governments would send delegates to discuss matters with the Commander-in-Chief. They would have to be housed, entertained, and humored, so the kitchen was kept quite active. Folding beds got a good deal of use in rooms which doubled as offices during the day and sleeping quarters at night. Beyond these many political demands, there was still an army to run and a host of the usual military details, all of which ran through headquarters, and most passed the eyes of the commander-in-chief. We wonder today how much time the general may have had for himself. Washington personally dealt not only with strategy, but with decisions concerning munitions, arms, troop supply, recruitment, and health. There was a stream of requests for leave, promotion, and appointments, and there was the expected amount of record keeping associated with troop pay, death rolls, desertions, and sickness. This was a busy, bustling, important center of a log city of thousands of troops and support personnel. Imagine what a day must have been like. The drums sounded reveille at dawn, even earlier during the longer days of late spring. Duties were to begin by 8 a.m. Even in the heart of winter, the camp was a bustle of activity. Assignments for work duty addressed the endless requirements for fortification and foraging. Firewood had to be procured from ever-increasing distances. Drill was a constant enterprise, especially after Baron Friedrich von Steuben's arrival in late February. And there were always pickets to be manned. 
this humdrum existence could be interrupted. Periodic forays against roving British units or other strategic missions constantly rotated men away from the main encampment. This relaxed to some degree the burden on the local resources. Detachments sent off elsewhere could find their own supplies and fend for themselves while they were away from camp. At the same time, they could perform a number of duties, from foraging to the surveillance and harassment of the enemy. As winter wore on, a few activities were curtailed. The men were too tired for exercise beyond their drills. Religious services were encouraged by the commander-in-chief, but structures were seldom large enough to handle many men at a time. Tattoo was sounded at sunset. Morale had its ups and downs. It was fueled by the fever pitch of building camp in December. Then, with the debilitating supply shortages of mid-February, it dipped to near-mutinous low. The prescribed ration was a pound of bread, a pound of beef or fish, one gill of whiskey or spirits, and half a pint of peas or beans. And at times, rations were available. Often, though, especially early in the encampment, the commissary department proved totally incapable of providing this or any ration to the men. What the troops had to eat would largely depend on procurement detachments sent into the outlying areas to find food and send it back to camp. Regularly, from December through February, all the systems would prove unreliable. While on campaign during the spring and summer, the army had come to rely on a quick bread named fire cake. A tasteless mixture of flour and water, it was easy to make when on the move. But once set up in camp, fire cake gave way to bread baked in numerous bake ovens scattered throughout the brigades. Still, the empty kettle was perhaps the single most disparaging influence on the Continental soldier, and even Washington feared a mutiny. Thankfully, by the end of February, markets had been established near camp where those with money could purchase supplies from local farmers. The food crisis was relaxed with the onset of spring, a healthy run of fish on the river, and the reformation of the quartermaster and commissary departments under the new leadership of Nathaniel Green and Jeremiah Wadsworth. Medical services, though, were never in very good supply. Overcrowding and poor sanitary habits made getting sick very likely. Washington found many distressing signs during his tours of the camp, and he issued frequent orders that were aimed at improving conditions. Many men slept on damp straw or on the ground itself, and were packed so tightly together that any outbreak of disease was ripe for an epidemic. Colds often escalated to pneumonia. Typhoid, typhus, and dysentery were prevalent. Wagons carrying the sick to hospitals were overcrowded and frequent. Frozen ground made digging difficult, and dead horses lay where they had fallen. Men did not always make use of the vaults to relieve themselves, despite repeated general orders to do so. Washington constantly beseeched his officers to improve sanitary conditions. Cartridges were to be burned in the huts to purify the air. Horses were to be buried, and care was to be taken to keep the sources of drinking water clean. Nevertheless, expedience seemed to be the order of the day. The soldiers were too cold, too tired, and few understood the implications of poor sanitation. The number of sick and wounded always dwarfed the facilities intended to care for them. By the middle of January, Regimental or flying hospitals were built within all brigade areas to lessen the load on the general hospitals. These flying hospitals were no more than large huts for initial treatment or for those not sick enough to be moved to the general hospitals. Orderlies frequently compounded minor illnesses by reissuing straw and blankets used by men who had died of contagious disease. Amputations were often fatal. 
Anesthesia was a block of wood to bite, and antiseptics were lacking. The smallpox inoculation program that began in January was successful in the fight against that killer. By May, women camp followers were recruited as nurses. When Baron von Steuben arrived in February, he thrust himself to the task of retraining the army, which had been hampered by its use of many different drills and practice maneuvers. Once a captain in the Prussian army, von Steuben had met Benjamin Franklin in Paris. Convinced that Steuben would be a help to the American cause, Franklin drafted letters of introduction and sent him to meet Washington. The general, acting on the advice of Franklin, made what was to be a very good appointment. The Prussian inspired the men with his thoroughness, his spit and polish brusqueness, and his fiery temper. Relishing the idea that he could make them battle ready, officers and enlisted men alike took notice. At first, some fellow officers were appalled that a general officer could and would act as an ordinary drill master. On the other hand, the army was willing to learn, and it became clear that here was the man who could teach them. The troops began to meld into cohesive, uniform fighting units, drilled by a corps of instructors trained by von Steuben himself. Maneuverability was improved by a shorter pace and slower cadence, both more suited for rough terrain. Men were able to march in close order, staying in step with the officer at the head of the column, and no longer relying on a cadence beat on a drum, a cadence which had in the past announced their position to the enemy. Reloading was simplified, and weapons within companies were standardized, allowing for concentration of volleys. Bayonet training was included in the daily routine. Many of the weapons of the day and other artifacts from the Revolutionary War are on display today, both at the Visitor Center and at the Museum of the Valley Forge Historical Society, adjacent to the Washington Memorial Chapel. With spring in the air, the confidence of the army flourished. Officers who in September had felt their sole responsibility was leading men in battle, now were duly enlightened. They learned to press for improvement in the care of weapons and equipment, and stressed individual cleanliness. Many of these officers, men like Anthony Wayne, had withstood the lure of resigning their commissions. They had turned a deaf ear to urgings from troubled or selfish families who wanted them home. This weeding out process assured a mature and committed corps of officers. They were much needed to direct a rank and file which suffered constant turnover through illness, expiration of enlistments, and desertion. This statue of Wayne facing towards his home in nearby Chester County is a tribute to those officers' dedication to duty. As spring arrived, the markets were alive with business, and new supplies arrived daily. Cattle, flour, whiskey, salt, and tallow. Orders were given to remove the mud chinking from the hut walls to allow air to circulate. The heartbeat of the camp quickened. A feeling of progress, so long absent, returned as May flowered. On May 6, 1778, the Continental Army put on a huge celebration in honor of the signing of the French Alliance. With this treaty, France recognized America as an independent country and guaranteed military support to help in its struggle with England. The cannon roared in 13-gun salutes. The men cheered. You can almost picture General George Washington's view as thousands of muskets fired the feu de joie, the fire of joy. A rolling thunder of fire up and down the double ranks of infantry assembled for this grand display. As new recruits and units from elsewhere rejoined Washington's force, an army of now 20,000 was poised to move. 
but decisions among the general staff were painstakingly cautious. It was decided to let the British make the first move. On June 19th, six months to the day after the army had marched into camp, it finally marched across Sullivan's Bridge and out of Valley Forge. These months of hard work, hunger, and illness had claimed some 2,000 lives. While most men died in outlying hospitals, one grave, that of Lieutenant John Waterman of Rhode Island, was located. Near that site, this stately obelisk serves as tribute to all who succumbed that winter. Just nine days after marching out of Valley Forge, the war was rejoined at the battle at Monmouth Courthouse, New Jersey. As this engagement would demonstrate, and as the ensuing campaign would prove, an army had indeed been transformed at Valley Forge. This National Memorial Arch, dedicated in 1917, commemorates the patience and the fidelity of the men who became that army, who came together and grew together in that crucible that was Valley Forge. Of all the names and all the places associated with America's struggle for independence, none speaks more of the suffering, sacrifice, and ultimate triumph than what happened here. No military battles were fought, no bayonet charges or artillery bombardments took place, and the defensive lines were never tested. But during the winter of 1777 to 1778, thousands of American soldiers died nonetheless. Valley Forge reminds us what man can do to survive against hunger, disease, and the unrelenting forces of nature. Then, during that winter, an army determined that it would prevail in a test of endurance. Today, this is a place where we can come to understand what that meant. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.